Okay. Quick, quick, quick question on English uh, idioms for Mr. Goward here. Okay, what, what do you say about somebody who doesn't close a door? Is it born in a barn or born in a field? What would you say? <laughs> oh, just point, when, you, when the last person comes in, you could close the door, right? So, not you, but someone else. Someone else. Anyway. Uh, I would say, were you born in a barn? As a kind of like a slight uh, way to chide somebody. But other people say, were you born in a field? I've heard that one as well. Right, now, uh, welcome back. So, have you got any ideas about um, uh, how to tell the difference? You know, if you were performing an experiment to find out whether you've got viable but non-culturable bacteria or dead bacteria. How could you, what could you do? Anybody have any ideas? Okay, put the agar plates at the right temperature so the VBNC can grow. Yeah, but the NC part is non-culturable. <laughs> so they, they don't grow. That's the definition of them. They don't grow under the culture conditions that, that you know about. Okay, so that will not work. Okay, but you don't have them in an agar plate to begin with. They're in a, they're in a liquid culture. They're in like a, a shaker flask. And yeah. Okay, so you can look for the optical density. Yeah, but even the dead bacteria will give you optical density, right? So the DO600 is live and dead and VBNC. And it's not, it's not enough to, to tell the difference. Okay, so I kind of get the idea. So what you're saying is, right, uh, at this when when they're growing, right, you put some radioactive marker. Which one would you use specifically to label proteins? Not necess not really important for what you're saying, but just phosphorus. No, is phosphorus a part of proteins? No. Okay, so the it's in proteins, but it's not nucleic. It's not in nucleic acids. This is the the thing you want to think about. Okay, hang on, hang on. We're thinking about radio label marking the proteins or other macromolecules. So what you can use for your radio labeled elements are often something like uh, um, nitrogen. I don't know what the number is of the radio element. Maybe carbon 13 or carbon 14 or tritium. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nitrogen is going to go in proteins, but it could also go into nucleotide bases, right? Because they have nitrogen and some of the biosynthetic pathways can recycle them. Yeah? Yes, methionine and cysteine in proteins have sulfur. 
nucleotides don't have sulfur. So if you want to specifically label proteins, you're going to give the, give the bacteria some 35S methionine, for example. So that's going to accumulate in the cells. If you want to specifically label DNA, you can have tritiated thymidine. Thymidine will only be incorporated into DNA, not RNA. Uh, if you want to label all nucleic acids, you can use 32 phosphorus in the alpha or the beta position. Probably the alpha position would be best, right? Yeah. Nearest the, uh, the sugar. Yeah, it would have to be alpha. So, uh, yeah, so if we're going to label the proteins, we want to give them some 35S methionine early on, and then we stop, change the medium, uh, culture them over here, and we want to see whether they release it or whether it's retained. Yeah, I think that would work. So the dead bacteria, they'll lice and they'll release it, right? Uh, and the live ones, they will retain it. Uh, it might work. It might work partially because not all the proteins are small soluble proteins. They might be associated with other structures in the cell and might not be released so easily. But okay, that might work. Okay. Um, I have to say though that the use of this kind of thing is rather the other way round, is that okay, what we want to find out is V, B, and C versus dead. So the viable but non-cultural bacteria, one of the parts of the definition is that they have detectable metabolism. So that means they might still be able to take up 35S methionine and incorporate it into their proteins. They might have a low rate of protein synthesis, but it shouldn't be zero. Whereas a dead cell is not, is not going to be synthesizing anything. So you can measure the uptake of you know, small precursors and their incorporation into macromolecules in the VBNC cells. That will work. Anything else? Okay, metabolically active. So if I give 35S methionine and I want to find out if they're synthesizing protein, what kind of metabolism is this? Anabolic or catabolic? Anabolic, yes. Everybody know what that means or not? Uh, you know, the, the Socratic method can only work if I, if, you, if, if, if I get some information coming back from you, you know. <laughs> okay, so building things up from a Simple precursors, this is anab anabolic metabolism. Catabolism is breaking that something down, okay? So if we do this, then we could test whether VB and C bacteria have anabolic metabolism. How about if we want to detect if they have catabolism? What might that be? You use glucose and you excrete I don't know, something else, some fermentation product. So you might want to find out if they are still able to ferment sugar or if they are still able to maintain ATP inside the cell. Dead cells will not do these things. Okay. So that's part of the answer. Um, the other part of the definition is what? Of VBNC. What was written down on the slide? Yes. So your viable 
but non culturable cell will still have an intact cell wall and cell membrane, whereas dead cells are going to be lysed. How can you tell the difference between these two? It's like what you said, they, they, these ones will release stuff. How about if you want to find that out in the opposite way? <laughs> Yeah, you want to have some kind of label that can only get inside the cell if the membrane is permeable. And this label is going to be excluded from cells with an intact membrane. So you could have some kind of fluorescent marker that is not membrane permeable. So you call this fluorescence one. And this one will only be able to stain the dead cells, right? And you're going to look at them under the fluorescence microscope or run them in a flow cytometer or some way to count the fluorescent cells. How can you count these ones? Because they'll be negative for fluorescence, right? So you can't see them. Uh, what you have to do is have a second fluorescent marker that is membrane permeable. So these dead cells will have both fluorescent colors, and the VBNC cells will just have one color. OK, that's pretty easy to do. You can do this in most labs. OK, yeah, so those, those are the kind of, wait, yes. How do you tell the difference between VBNC and ordinary live bacteria? is because, well, they don't grow. So you spread them out on a agar plate and you count how many ordinary live bacteria there are. Yeah. Yeah, so this will be VBNC plus alive, this test. OK, that's enough about that. So I just should point out for today and for Thursday, on the timetable, these second sessions are listed as TD. But it's really just the same as what I've just done now. So it's kind of a lecture format. So I'm very sorry for anybody who has prepared some of the TD exercises. If, if, if anybody corresponding to that definition is in the room, I'm, I'm really sorry. OK, so I'm afraid that means you have to uh, spend the next hour or so um, listening to me again. Yeah, about an hour. So just carrying on with uh, bacterial culture. OK, so all of this, you know, the different phases of the growth curve, lag, exponential, stationary, and the death phase. This is what happens if you get like a one liter flask, put some bacteria in it, and it grows for overnight. That's batch culture. Now, sometimes, so for a lot of work that you might need to do in a research laboratory, like produce a recombinant protein or a plasmid prep, that's perfectly fine. Works really very well. but for some applications, you might want to have bacteria growing in the exponential phase for longer. And the way to do this is to try and set up the culture system where you continually add fresh medium and you continually take out some of the bacteria. And this kind of setup is called a chemostat because the chemical environment is static in a chemostat. And the way it works is pretty simple, basically. So you have the culture vessel here. So you have the volume of medium in there with the bacteria that are growing. You've got some kind of system to stir it around so the, the, uh, all, all the nutrients and the bacteria stay 
in suspension homogeneously, and you have air coming in to make sure that there's a constant concentration of oxygen. And what you do is you connect this up to a big reservoir of new medium, which is going to flow into the culture vessel at a particular rate defined by this pump. And the volume inside here remains constant because as the excess medium comes in, as the new medium comes in, the excess volume is taken away into the recipient that you have for collecting the biomass, the bacteria, or whatever product it is that you want to extract from them. It could be secreted or it could be in the, in the, in the cell fraction. Now, the trick with this is to try and regulate the flow of medium so that you maximize the bacterial growth rate in here and you maximize the amount of bacteria that you can recover on a fixed period of time without you know having the flow rate that's too high and everything gets washed out now I'm not a big expert about this but I, I, I did try and do some kind of preparation on this on this topic and it appears that the, the, the real thing that you have to worry about is the uh, dilution rate. So that the dilution rate is the flow rate divided by the volume of the culture flask. So if you've got a flow rate of 200 ml per hour and the volume in your culture flask is one liter, then the dilution rate is 0 0.2. If you've got one liter in the flask and you put in one liter of new medium per hour, your flow rate is one. Okay, you replace everything per over an hour. So on the graph here is represented in the blue line the biomass of the bacteria that are in the culture. And in the red line, this is the concentration of the nutrient that's at the limiting concentration. So if you've got a rich, uh, complex culture medium, somewhere in there, there will be one nu nutrient which is limiting in concentration. And we just think about that one. We don't care about all the rest because all the rest is in excess. So you have to try and imagine in this theoretical system that initially the bacteria are kind of just in water. They have nothing, right? So once you start to increase the flow rate here, you increase the amount of the essential nutrient in the medium, in the culture medium. And of course, the, 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 the rate of bacterial growth is very, very, in increases quickly until you get a reasonable amount of bacteria in the culture vessel. And after a while, you reach an equilibrium position here, during which, as you add more medium, this allows bacteria to, the bacteria to grow faster. But because there's more medium going through the system, more and more bacteria get removed at the same time. So the system reaches an equilibrium. All right? And this equilibrium lasts for a reasonable uh, amount of different uh, dilution rates. Except if you go too fast, if you're putting too much new medium in, at the end, you'll take out too many bacteria. And at the end, you'll wash them all out, and you'll have nothing left in the system. So the idea is, uh, and it turns out that, in fact, for the production, okay, the optimal rate for producing a large amount of biomass in a short time is going to be at this point in the curve. Okay, because the concentration of bacteria in the culture medium is constant here, but your dilution rate is higher. So you're putting more medium through the system per unit time. So the overall yield you're going to get is much higher here than over here. Okay. Now, Theoretically, you could do one or two small experiments. You could find out what these curves look like, and you'll say, OK, right, I'll, I'll just uh, set my, uh, my, my, uh, my pump to give me a, uh, a dilution rate of 0 0.6. I'll leave it going for three or four days, and I'll come back uh, uh, and pick everything up when it's finished. But of course, that's a bit risky, because at the optimum here is very close to uh, the situation where you start to have too much flow. So the way chemostats really work is that they are coupled to uh, a detector on the effluent tube. 
So the amount of bacteria that are in the culture vessel here is monitored continuously. And this is used to control the pump that determines the dilution rate. So at the beginning, OK, you increase the dilution rate. You increase the dilution rate. So you're going along this curve. And then once the OD600 starts to go down here, then the dilution rate is reduced. Okay. So you've got a dynamic control of the, di of the flow of the new medium through the system so that you can optimize production. So this is a continuous culture system. And it's different from batch culture because during the whole of the culture period, the bacteria here are in the exponential growth phase. And this can last for one day, two days, three days, one week, two weeks, depending on the setup. And that can be useful for some kind of industrial production, bacteria that are being cultured to, to produce something interesting. And it can also be used in some research projects when you might be interested in how growing bacteria can evolve resistance to antibiotics, for example. How they can co-evolve with uh, bacteriophages, that is, viruses that infect the, bac the, the, the bacteria and can lyse them. So the, the reason a chemostat is going to be useful for those types of experiments is because during the whole course of the experiment, the physiological state of these bacteria is going to be constant. They're always going to be in the exponential growth phase. So it's more reproducible than running a series of subcultures. So to get the same number of generations, you might have to subculture your culture like uh, six or seven times with the same kind of uh, experimental stress. And the results will be more variable than if you use a chemostat. OK, so that's really all there is to say about bacterial culture in the liquid phase. So it's important to understand that in the real world, free living bacteria in, a, in liquid certainly exist, like in the oceans, for example. There are plenty of pelagic bacteria. But there are also many situations where bacteria grow in biofilms. That is a community of microbes that grow together as a kind of film on the top of some kind of surface. Uh, so you just kind of, kind of visualize some kind of slime growing on something. So for example, you know, uh, ah, yeah. So this, this, this is important for, uh, yeah, so, OK. I forgot the way I was talking about this. So some of these uh, biofilms can be mono species. So one bacterium is going to colonize a surface and synthesize an exopolymer where they live. And these can be medically very important. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa, it's a lung pathogen, very, very dangerous for people who have cystic fibrosis. One of the uh, virulence mechanisms of Pseudomonas aeruginosa is to produce a biofilm that makes it very, very difficult to expel the bacteria when you cough. Staphylococcus aureus also has the capacity to you know, colonize plastic surfaces of catheters and medical devices. And the biofilm can protect the bacterium from you know, ordinary cleaning procedures, so they can be very, very difficult to remove. So, that's a cause of uh, uh, infections in uh, hospitals. Now, there are, so these, I think, probably in the natural world are relatively unusual situations. Most biofilms will be multi species. So, several species of bacteria or species of bacteria and eukaryotes will form a community uh, that is structured on, as a, uh, in, in three dimensions on some kind of surface. So for example, uh, tomorrow morning, you could have a look in your shower. If you've got some of this kind of like gray, light brown kind of film on the plastic sheet, so that's a, that's a biofilm. And if you look, you'll probably have methylobacterium and sphingomonas species in there. In everybody's teeth, you know, dental plaque, 
You know, you go to the dentist and then he or she will scrape it all off. Six months later, it's all grown back. That's because it's a biofilm. It's a community of microorganisms which has a kind of uh, extracellular matrix that holds it all together. In itself, you know, not actually harmful for your teeth if it's a healthy, normal plaque uh, microbiome. Uh, but, you know, you might want to get rid of it for aesthetic reasons. And it's traumatolis, you know, these uh, communities of microbes that have been existing on rocks for the last three and a half billion years. They are, you know, multi-species uh, uh, biofilms. So, how do these biofilms form? Well, conceptually, people have broken down the process into five stages. Firstly, bacteria have got to adhere loosely to the surface. And this is a reversible process, so they can be washed off. After that, they have to definitively attach to the surface. And this requires the expression of specific adhesins, which can often be pili, okay? curly or CU type pili, maybe type 4. Once the bacteria have attached strongly to the surface, then they start to grow. They grow and colonize the surface. Then, at a particular point, when there's enough of them, they'll start to synthesize the polymer that is secreted, which forms the extracellular matrix around the bacterium. So that's step three, is synthesis of an exopolymer. And this is what's going to allow the biofilm to grow and mature. And at this point, other species can come and get uh, associated with the biofilm. Because you can certainly imagine the case where it's w only one species can firstly colonize the inert surface or the biological surface. And then once the exopolymer is, is expressed, then other bacteria can come along and stick onto this uh, exopolymer. So that's when you start to have a kind of multi-species biofilm which grows bigger. And then finally, it's going to, uh, uh, it's almost, ah, I was going to say explode. It looks like it's exploding here, but it's not so dramatic as that. It can, you know, dissociate, I think would be the better term. So it's going to kind of dissociate and release free, free living bacteria, which can then, you know, disperse and colonize other surfaces. So you have bacteria which are, in fact, uh, you know, flipping between two different lifestyles. Maybe a free-living pelagic lifestyle where the bacteria can grow in suspension in a liquid culture, and then a kind of more sedentary phase of their life cycle in a biofilm. So if you only look at the growth of bacteria in a liquid culture, you're kind of understanding half of their lifestyle, but not the whole thing. So the only thing to say about this here is that the last stage here, this dispersion, is also a control process. So this requires the expression of particular adhesins. This requires expression of the genes evolved in the synthesis of the ex exopolymer. And the dispersion stage also requires the expression of enzymes that can break down the polymer, and that's going to allow the bacteria to escape. So the, you know, it's not just, you know, it gets too big and it gets washed off when you come around and uh, clean your shower curtain. It's not, it's not that. Now, the question here that I want to focus on is, is number three, because this is an example of a kind of collective behavior in the bacterial community. And it will only occur if the bacteria are sufficiently numerous, if there's enough of them present on the surface. And this kind of like uh, collective action or uh, coordinated action on behalf of the bacteria was first described in a rather unusual context, in a species of uh, symbiotic bacteria that live in, uh, on uh, octopuses called Vibio fissurae. So these bacteria colonize the uh, 
light producing organ on, on the surface of this, the skin of the octopus, right? And there are really very high concentration of bacteria here. And what they can do is they can produce a luciferase enzyme which produces light. So it's not the octopus cells that does this, it's the, it's the symbiotic bacteria. So to you know, understand this process, at the end of the 70s, there were researchers who isolated the bacterium from these patches, these are, you know, light producing patches on the skin and put them in culture. And what they found was that at low cell densities, the bacteria did not produce light, but if they became highly concentrated, they could produce light. And that meant that they were producing the luciferase enzyme that was required to produce light. Okay. So then they started to, you know, over the next, um, uh, you know, decade or a couple of decades, people worked out how the, what was controlling this system, because it was it was interesting because you had something where you go you have genes expressed by all of the bacteria, all right, in this culture, at the same time, and it depends on how many of them there are. So somehow they had a way of measuring how many bacteria there were locally. Okay? So this is what's called quorum sensing. Okay, a quorum is when you have enough people to take a valid decision. So this activity, you know, producing the luciferase enzyme, only occurs when there are enough bacteria. And the question is, how do they know? Right? Because they can't like sit around and count okay, and see how many there are. They're bacteria. Bacteria don't count. So, the, when okay, so this was all worked out, you know, 20 years ago now. So this is a diagram from a, a review article published in 2001. And the way it works is like this. So the luciferase enzyme here is coded on a gene locus called LUX, which codes for several proteins. So. A, B, C, D, and E are the enzymes that are necessary to produce light, okay? What is going to be interesting for the, us is Lux I here for inducer. Now, the Lux I protein can synthesize a small molecule called the autoinducer. So this small molecule can diffuse out of the bacterium and if there are a low number of bacteria present, then it just diffuses away. It's lost. However, if you've got a high concentration of bacteria, then the concentration of this autoinducer can increase. It gets up to 1 to 10 micrograms per ml. And if the, con the extracellular concentration is high, then it will diffuse back in and bind to, well, called the Lux uh, repressor, I guess, and or Lux regulator, and the complex between the autoinducer and the Lux regulator will increase the expression of all these proteins here. So you'll get even more Lux I produced, which is going to produce more autoinducer, which is going to bind more to the Lux regulator, which is going to improve, produce more, more Lux I. So you've got a positive feedback mechanism, which means that once this starts to go, it's really going to build up very, very quickly. And all of these other proteins here, A, B, C, D, and E, are synthesized following the same regulatory circuit. So the concentration of these proteins is going to really increase quickly, and these bacteria will produce light. And all of the bacteria in that same culture vessel will do this at the same time, because they have all detected the same extracellular concentration of the autoinducer. Okay, Lux R, what is this doing? So Lux R is the regulator, it's, it's expressed from a different gene, and it will inhibit itself. So this is a kind of negative feedback mechanism, which means that the whole thing doesn't run completely out of control. So what is the autoinducer uh, in Vibrio fischeri? It's a, well, small lipid-soluble molecule, N-acyl homoserine lactone. Uh, okay, so this is homoserine. If you imagine this as an OH, that would be serine here, right? But this cyclic structure is homoserine. And this is the lactone part. So R is a, diff a functional group which can be different between different bacteria. So 
the AHL, acyl homocerine lactone system, is used by many different gram negatives as a quorum sensing mechanism. So, for example, it's in agrobacterium tumefaciens and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's important in inducing biofilm formation. So it's an important virulence mechanism, okay? So the bacteria colonizing somebody's lung, at the beginning, there's not very many of them, so they're trying to you know, just hide, just uh, keep quiet. And then when there's enough, okay, we'll really start going here. We'll start colonizing this tissue and taking it over, produce the biofilm. When there's enough of them. Okay, so the AHL system is used by different gram negatives. Gram positives have different types of quorum sensing mechanisms. One of them which is frequently found is based on circular uh, short, yeah, short peptides with a kind of circular structure. So these are for auto-inducer peptides. So for example, they're involved in controlling virulence of Staphylococcus aureus and in controlling sporulation in Bacillus subtilis. So once there are too many bacteria growing, they'll realize there are too many of us, okay, we can't carry on growing, let's produce spores. How does this work? Okay, so the peptide is produced from a precursor protein synthesized on pi ribosomes. The peptide is then cleaved and it's exported and you know, just like for AHL, the concentration, the extracellular concentration will begin to increase when you've got a lot of bacteria locally. Now, peptides, they can't diffuse across the plasma membrane. So for this system, there's a specific detector protein which combine, which is in the plasma membrane, which can bind to these peptides. This binding will introduce a signaling cascade which ends up turning on a set of genes that are under control of this system. Okay, so that's quorum sensing and how it works in gram positives and gram negatives. So for this part, you know, nutritional types, bacterial growth, the things to remember, uh, these basic terms, Never ever get mixed up between oxotroph and autotroph. They sound very close, very similar, but they mean entirely different things. For culture media, defined medium, complex medium, selective differential medium. And then in the growth curve, the lag exponential, stationary, and death phase, how to calculate the generation time, and then for uh, control of growth, quorum sensing, and switching between free living pelagic forms and uh, bacteria growing in biofilms. Okay, so that gives us about 40 minutes left to uh, cover the effects of different environmental pressures on bacterial growth. And I, I, I kind of uh, I apologize in advance about this because it's going to be a bit of a catalog, okay? But you have to, uh, everybody has to know this. There's no escaping from it. So we're going to start with temperature, okay? So what you can do once you know how to analyze the bacterial growth curve and calculate the growth rate is that you can culture bacteria at different times and measure their growth rate. And what you find, okay, so this is the growth rate here. And what you'll find is that below a certain temperature, many bacteria will not grow at all. Then after you increase from the, this temperature, then they will grow faster and faster and faster until they reach a kind of maximum optimal growth temperature. And then if you increase the temperature even more, they will grow much less and finally will not be able to grow. 
So for each bacterium, you can define minimal growth temperature, optimal growth temperature, and the maximal growth temperature. So these are the cardinal temperatures for bacterial growth for each species, each strain. OK, what is happening here? It's all down to lipid and protein biochemistry. So here at low temperatures, all the enzymes that are involved in the bacterial metabolism are going to be adapted for maximum activity at the optimal growth temperature. If the temperature is too low, all the enzymatic reactions will be performed very, very slowly. Also, the membrane lipid biochemistry will be adapted for growth at this temperature. So at lower temperatures, the membrane lipids will be too rigid. Okay, so membrane you know, pour-ins, membrane transport, this kind of function will not work. And that's why the bacteria will not grow. At higher temperatures, of course, all the enzymes in the bacterial cell are made out of proteins. If you increase the temperature, they will begin to denature and won't function anymore. Okay, just like boiling an egg. So it's kind of simple. Now, if you do that for different species of bacteria, you can define bacteria that are that prefer cold temperatures, you know, ordinary body temperature or high temperatures. So we'll go through this. So uh, bacteria that really prefer to grow at 10 degrees or less, uh, psychrophilic bacteria. So these bacteria can be found, you know, in the Arctic Ocean, off the coast of Greenland, uh, you know, where the ocean temperature is generally going to be about five degrees or less. Uh, because of the salt concentration, then, you know, there are some bacteria that can grow at minus two or minus three degrees in the presence of, uh, you know, uh, salt water, which is not solid. So these bacteria will not grow above 25 degrees basically because their lipid membranes are adapted to function at low temperature. So they'll be polyunsaturated, quite fluid lipids. And if you increase the temperature to 30 degrees, for example, all of these membranes will become very unstable and the bacteria will die. Now you also have things called psychotrophic bacteria, which in fact, prefer to grow at 20 to 30 degrees, but can grow quite happily down to about zero degrees. So the big classic for this one is Listeria monocytogenes, which uh, you know is a foodborne pathogen. Uh, can grow on things like uh, pate, uh, rillette, uh, meat products, and if you've got the same tin of uh, rillette in your fridge. You've opened it, contaminated it with listeria. You leave it in the fridge for three weeks and then eat a bit more of it. Well, you can be very ill because listeria can grow really well at four degrees and they'll multiply to quite a high concentration in those conditions. However, most human pathogens are mesophilic bacteria. That is, they'll have an optimal growth temperature of 20 to 40 degrees. They won't grow above 50, and they won't really grow below 15 degrees. So they can't grow in the fridge. Now above that, then you have thermophilic and hyperthermophilic bacteria. So thermophiles like to grow at 55 to 60. Hyperthermophiles prefer to grow at temperatures above 80 degrees. So these are really specialists that can live in a hot springs where the water is, you know, coming out at, uh, you know, 50 degrees. And down at the bottom of the ocean in hydrothermal vents, the temperature can be higher than 100 degrees because of the water pressure is so high. So that's why you can have some bacteria that can grow up to, you know, like 110 or 120 degrees. And so I put this one in blue because this is an archaebacteria. So 
of a lot of these extremophiles, bacteria that can live in extreme conditions of temperature, pH, etc., or salt conditions, are archaea. Okay, so how can uh, these bacteria survive and function at such higher temperatures? Well, firstly, their lipid membranes are adapted to high temperatures, so they'll have longer fatty acid chains, unsaturated, and with branched lipid lipids. Also, archaebacteria have radically different membrane, bio, membrane biochemistry. And some of their fatty acid chains go across the membrane. Okay, so if you think about, you know, a lipid membrane, you've got something like this. Okay, uh, in our cells and in new bacteria. But in archaea, they also have a mixture of things that are like this, and some of the fatty acid chains span the membrane. So this structure is very, very stable and can resist high temperatures, at least in uh, these hyperthermophilic bacteria. So the membrane biochemistry is adapted to high temperatures and also protein structure. So in thermophiles, thermophilic bacteria, you'll have proteins with a lot of hydrophobic bonds on the inside of the protein. Uh, so if you remember your physical chemistry, the hydrophobic interaction becomes stronger as the temperature increases. So it means that once these proteins are folded, they don't really denature at high temperature. Also, they tend to have a lot of proline. So proline is the only circular amino acid, and it's less flexible when it's in a chain than all the other amino acids. So there's less kind of flexibility and possibility for, you know, um, just like mo movement, which, which is going to increase with temperature. So the proteins of these thermophilic and hyperthermophilic bacteria are intrinsically resistant to heat denaturation. So that's very useful if we want to extract enzymes from these bacteria that will still work at 50 or 60 degrees or even at 90 degrees. So big example for uh, biotechnology and molecular biology is TAC polymerase, DNA polymerase from Thermus aquaticus which stays active even if you heat it to 95 degrees for several cycles in a PCR reaction. Okay. The next thing we need to think about is the uh, ability of bacteria to use oxygen for their metabolism, or if not, at least their ability to survive in the presence of oxygen. And the way you can determine this experimentally is by setting a, up a culture in soft agar in a tube like this. So you can inoculate bacteria all the way down the tube. And then when the agar sets, you'll generate an oxygen gradient. So at the top, where the tube is open to the air, the agar is open to the air, you'll have an environment with a high concentration of oxygen. And then as you go down, you have less and less, and then you'll have an anaerobic environment in the bottom of the tube. So obligate aerobes will only grow at the top. Obligate anaerobes will only grow at the bottom. Facultative anaerobes, these bacteria can use oxygen, they prefer to grow in the presence of oxygen, but they can grow anaerobically. They'll have a higher density, they grow better at the top of the tube, but they will grow all the way down to here. Aerotolerant anaerobes will grow all the way through the tube. They can grow in the presence of oxygen, but in fact they don't use oxygen for their metabolism. So they don't grow any better at the top, than they do at the bottom. And then finally, microaerophilic bacteria require oxygen, but they can't actually live with a high concentration. 
So they don't grow right at the top, they don't grow right at the bottom, they'll grow in a narrow band somewhere near the top of the tube where oxygen is present but the concentration is not too high. Now, what you need to know is at least have an idea of some kind of uh, bacteria that correspond to each of these categories. So, obviously, strict air anaerobes, Bacteroides, Clostridium, uh, facultative anaerobe, uh, E. coli. Uh, for uh, an obligate aerobe, often probably Bacillus subtilis is the classical one that people will cite. So I checked this out just the other day. And in fact, it can grow anaerobically in some conditions. But if anyone wants to give Bacillus subtilis as an example of an obligate aerobe, I accept that. But Mycobacterium is also in that category. So Mycoaerophilic Campylobacter, for example. So the, the, the problem with oxygen generally is that it's toxic. And it's especially toxic if you want to use it as an electron acceptor during energy metabolism. Because if you use oxygen as an electron acceptor, what can occur is you start with a molecule of oxygen gas, and you add an electron to this. And this will give you an oxygen uh, superoxide radical. This is highly reactive. It can react with lipids, with DNA, with protein, and screw everything up. So aerobic respiration will always produce, tend to produce some kind of superoxide radical. And other electron transport chains in bacterial metabolism can also produce this type of oxygen, activated oxygen product uh, by accident, if oxygen is present. So bacteria that are going to survive and grow in the presence of oxygen need to be able to remove the superoxide radical. And that's the job of the superoxide dismutase. Okay? So all of these bacteria that can tolerate at least the presence of some oxygen must have superoxide dismutase, which is going to convert this to hydrogen peroxide. I guess it's kind of adding some water here. Hydrogen peroxide is less toxic than the superoxide radical, but it's still pretty toxic. You, know, can, you, can, you can use a dilute uh, hydrogen peroxide to disinfect something. It's a very good disinfection agent because it degrades to water and uh, oxygen, so it doesn't leave anything which is toxic. So at higher concentrations of oxygen, to survive, bacteria also need to remove hydrogen peroxide, which is the job of catalase which will degrade this into water and some oxygen. So bacteria that can really grow well, you know, at the, with high oxygen concentration, they have to have catalase, okay? So obligate aerobes and facultative anaerobes have, also have catalase. These guys, not so much. Now one of the things that I've always wondered, you know, is uh, if you're going to set up a culture like this, how do you get the anaerobes in order to be able to put them in the culture? Because normally when you're working in the microbiology lab, you've got the Petri dishes, you streak them out, and you put them in the incubator. But, of course, the bacteria are on the surface of the agar, right? They're open to the air. So... In order to be able to work with these anaerobes, there's two options. Once you, it is possible to have like a completely sealed microbiological safety cabinet with no oxygen inside it and a completely sealed incubator. But this is you know big, expensive lab equipment. 
most laboratories don't have this. So the cheapest and easiest way to culture anaerobes is to use a system like this, where you put the petri dishes stacked up in this jar, and you include this small bag of chemicals here, and you add some water before screwing the lid tight here. So when you add water to this, you have sodium borohydride, which will release hydrogen gas. And you also have citric acid and sodium bicarbonate, which will react together to produce carbon dioxide and more hydrogen. And up in the lid here, you have a catalyst, which will allow the hydrogen to react with the oxygen in the atmosphere and form water. So the chemicals in here release hydrogen, which will then react and uh, eliminate all the oxygen that's present in the gas here. And you can also use special agar plates, which have got thioglycolate, which will absorb and react with all the oxygen that might be left in the agar. And the other thing is that you have a small indicator a piece of paper with a methylene blue in it, which apparently, in the absence of oxygen, will turn white. So this is how you create an environment with zero oxygen for the growth of obligate anaerobes, strict anaerobes. OK, pH. Now, most bacteria prefer to grow at a pH close to neutral. So they won't grow a pH higher than 8 or pH lower than 5.5. However, at either extreme, there are acidophilic and alkalophilic bacteria. Um, alkalophilic bacteria prefer to grow you know, pH 8 to 11. And some of them can grow really, really in very strongly uh, alkaline environments. And you find them in alkaline lakes, extreme environments. Now, acidophiles, you know, I haven't really put an optimal pH in here because it's very different when you are talking about something like lactobacillus, which is kind of acidophile, but, it, you know, it's not going to grow very much at pH 2 can grow down to pH 4, for example. But, and that's rather different compared to something like these extreme acidophiles, like sulfurlobus or ferroplasma. So these ones, these archaebacteria, will be found you know, in hot springs with a very, very acidic environment. They can grow in like you know, one molar sulfuric acid, something like that. Now, these extremophiles, I don't really know how they survive at such low pH. Okay? Uh, so uh, what, what I'm going to say next does not really apply to these archaea over here. But for these other bacteria, while they are able to grow at acidic or alkaline pH, the cytosol of the cell, or the bacterial cell, rests, stays close to a neutral pH. So there's some kind of a pH homeostasis that occurs in bacteria. So, for example, uh, like uh, gram negatives like E. coli, if they are in acidic conditions, then they will express a proton ATPase, which pumps out proteins from the cytosol of the cell that maintain a, a neutral pH. And they will also express uh, chaperone proteins, which will prevent the aggregation and the precipitation of proteins if the cytosol becomes too acidic. Okay, so if you think about the surface of a protein, to remain in solution, it's got to have charge on the surface, positive and negative charge. And this will be modified at different pH conditions. Okay, so the carboxylate group 
can be protonated and become non-charged. And so if the surface of the protein loses too much charge, it can precipitate, okay? So under acid stress, gram negatives like E. coli will produce chaperone proteins, which will prevent this precipitation of, uh, uh, of uh, proteins due to the change on the surface charge. So that's how they kind of, you know, try to maintain a constant pH or, or try and mitigate acid stress. So for some alkalophilic bacteria, for certainly the uh, extreme uh, alkalophiles, they can export sodium and import protons to try and maintain the pH of the cytosol at a pH closer to neutral than what you have at the outside of the bacterium. Okay, next thing we need to think about is salt. So most bacteria actually prefer to grow uh, with about 0 0.2 molar NaCl, and they won't grow above one molar salt. Most of them can grow pretty happily, you know, in a hypotonic uh, um, uh, solution. However, some bacteria are halo-tolerant, like Staphylococcus, so it will grow on Chapman agar with 1.3 molar salt. And there are also some real halophiles, which actually prefer to grow when salt concentration is higher than one molar, or even, you know, four molar salt is the optimum for halobacterium. So these bacteria are adapted to grow in, you know, hypersaline environments. So Ectothiorhodospira is a purple sulfur bacterium which can grow in uh, salt marshes, you know, where you produce uh, sea salt, like in Guérande. So as the seawater evaporates, it becomes very, very uh, hypersaline. And, you know, this uh, purple sulfur bacterium can actually grow in those conditions. Uh, even more extreme is halobacterium, which can grow, you know, almost up to saturated salt conditions. Because over six molar, you know, salt precipitates out. So you can find this one in the in the Dead Sea. Yeah, so hypertonic conditions, hypertonic conditions, just like for pH, bacteria need to maintain a constant osmotic, or, or they need to have some kind of regulation of the osmotic uh, strength of the, of the cell, okay? So under hypertonic conditions, it's not the concentration of sodium inside the cell that's a big problem because, you know, the bacteria have got sodium transporters in the plasma membrane, so they can regulate the concentration of sodium inside the cell. The problem is, if there's a lot of sodium outside the cell, then the water from the bacterium is going to is going to diffuse out by osmosis and the bacterium is going to be too dry, it's going to desiccate. So they have to present, prevent water loss and this occurs in most bacteria by the accumulation of compatible solutes. So compatible means that these small molecules are not going to interfere with membrane function, enzyme function, protein structure, this kind of stuff. So they are small organic molecules that carry some kind of charge, okay? So one of the most frequent ones is glycine betaine. And a betaine, chemically, is a molecule that's got a nitrogen here attached to three methyl groups and carries a positive charge. So if you imagine this with NH3+, that would be glycine, right? The amino acid. So glycine betaine has got these three methyl groups. So the bacteria accumulate large amounts of these compatible solutes, so the osmotic strength inside the cell is increased and it allows the bacterium to retain water, even at strong salt concentrations outside the cell. So that, that works for, you know, like might be working like this for Staphylococcus aureus. Now in the uh, extreme halophiles, that's not enough. So, for example, halobacteria will actually accumulate potassium ions 
as a way of balancing out the, the very strong concentrations of sodium outside the cell. Now, if the uh, concentration of salt outside the cell is too low, it's kind of the opposite problem. Water will diffuse into the cell and um, you know, produce osmotic stress. So the, bank, so the cell is going to swell up and press against the, the cell wall. So one thing that the bacteria can do is try and reverse this process. And these compatible solutes can be polymerized and concentrated in inclusion granules. So their free concentration is reduced. So the osmotic strength inside the cell is reduced and bacteria will have less tendency to accumulate water. Now, if that's not enough, then bacteria can have pores in the membrane, which are mechanosensitive. So when the membrane is getting pushed out, then these pores can open and allow solutes to escape from the cell. OK, so the, the, the question of salt the salt concentration outside the cell is one example of bacteria you know, having to survive in conditions where water is more or less uh, available. And uh, the kind of general way to think about this is with something called the activity of water. Okay, so the idea behind this is that you know, in pure water, all the water that's there can be, is available to be involved in enzymatic reactions. So it's available for the bacteria to use. But in a kind of complex substrate, you know, a lot of this water might be uh, strongly bound, associated with other molecules in whatever it is, and not be ready available, readily available to support bacterial growth. And the way to formalize this in physical chemical terms is to talk about the chemical potential of water. Okay, so the chemical potential of water in a complex mixture is equal to the chemical potential of pure water plus RT log the activity of water. So R is the gas constant, T is absolute temperature, and the activity of water is going to be a value between 1 and 0. If you have 1, the log of 1 is 0, so this term becomes 0, and pure water, right? So as you get lower than 1, this term is going to become negative. So the chemical potential of the water in a complex mixture is going to be less than what you have in pure water. OK, so once you've got this, then we can go through a whole bunch of steps in uh, physical chemistry. So apparently, in an ideal solution, the activity of water is equal to the molar fraction of water in the solution. And this is kind of useful because if you have an ideal solution, then you can apply Raoult's law, which tells you what the vapor pressure is going to be. Yeah, I can see some people falling asleep right now. That's the power of physical chemistry. I understand. I feel your pain. But no, it won't last very long. That's all I can say. OK, just hang on in there a couple of minutes, because Raoult's law tells us that if you've got an ideal solution, the vapor pressure of water, for example, in this solution is going to be equal to the vapor pressure of pure water multiplied by the molar fraction of water in that solution, which is the activity of water, which is what we just said. Now, that is very useful because if we rearrange this, it tells us that the activity of water in the thing that we're interested in is equal to the vapor pressure of water that's released by that substrate divided by the vapor pressure of water for pure water. What is that? Well, that's the same as the relative humidity. Okay. That's useful because you can actually measure this parameter. And that's how you can measure the activity of water in any type of substrate. A solution of salt, okay, that's very easy. Okay, you, you can calculate it just by the concentration of salt. But if you're talking about a Mars bar, 
or a piece of cheese or a piece of meat, uh, you know, it's not so easy to figure out what the activity of water is going to be in there, and you have to have a way to measure it. And you do that by measuring the relative humidity that is uh, released by this substrate. So all of this is a kind of long introduction to say that this thing, the activity of water, is extremely important in food microbiology because most bacteria really like to grow at an activity of water or superior to or greater than 0 0.98. 0 0.98 is about the activity of water in, you know, seawater. You know, you know, salty water. So, you know, meat, fresh fruit, vegetables, your body, these are all environments where the activity of water is greater than 0 0.98. And most bacteria will grow very happily in these conditions. And then once you start to, you know, prepare food, often the types of food that can be stored are slightly dehydrated. And this is going to prevent the growth of most bacteria that might be in the food, okay? So, um, you know, something like a piece of salami or a saucisson uh, seca, you know, the, the activity of water is going to start to get really low, and most bacteria will not be able to grow on these types of food. Uh, you know, things like grains, you know, dried lentils, stuff like this. The activity of water here is going to be about 0 0.7. No bacteria will be able to grow on them. Problem is going to be, you know, contamination by uh, mold, okay, Penicillium aspergillus. These microbes are more adapted at growing at lower uh, water activities than bacteria. Okay, so very important for food conservation, all right? So what tends to happen, well, what tends to happen, or how bacterial growth is controlled in foods is often a combination of these different physical chemical factors, okay? So something like industrial pita bread here. It's going to, you know, microbial spoiling is going to be controlled by, you know, lower activity of water, so most bacteria won't grow here. Mold can grow on this, okay? But this is going to be controlled by removing all the oxygen from the packaging and replacing it with a mixture of nitrogen and carbon dioxide because molds, aspergillus, penicillium, they are all obligate aerobes. They do not grow at all without oxygen. So, you know, uh, if you get a packet of this, you might find a kind of double packet like this sometimes. And you'll see one of them has got like mold going on it and the other one hasn't. That's because the packaging has been damaged. Oxygen's got in and then the spores that are there can germinate and they'll eat your bread. Uh, this is another one, uh, intermediate uh, humidity food. Who, who would eat this? Who, who would give this to their dog to eat? Nobody. Oh, you're so cruel. You're going to starve. Okay, this is dog food, cat food. It's got low activity of water. You can store it at room temperature for a long time, long periods. Nothing can grow on this, not even mold, okay? But it's still tasty enough to eat. You don't have to, like, cook it like pasta. Okay, I, I, I say it's tasty enough to eat, but don't get the idea that I actually tried this, okay? That... Yeah, my dog tells me that it's tasty enough to eat. Okay, so cheese, something like this, you know, you know, kind of hard, uh, uh, mature cheese. No, some of the water's taken out of it, so it's got a quite activity of water starting to reduce. pH is quite acidic, so this is going to stop most bacteria from growing. Inside the cheese, of course, there's no oxygen, so nothing can can grow on it. So this can be stored, you know, in the in the cellar for a long time, and it won't go off. Okay, mice and rats can come in and eat it, but that's a different problem. And then, you know, yogurt, something like this, low pH is going to prevent most bacteria from growing, but you have to keep it at low temperature. Okay, so you combine these things, pH, availability of water, temperature, oxygen. And it's, you know, 
big application of understanding what are the physical chemical limitations to bacterial growth. Okay, we have four minutes just to hang on. Okay, so I'm going to try and finish up with this slide here. Um, I do it? Okay, let me, let's take a vote, perhaps. I mean, who wants to carry on and finish this? And who says, come on, we can do it on Thursday? Who says, let's carry on? <laughs> who says, Thursday, Thursday, please, oh God, Thursday. Okay, the Thursdays have it, the Thursdays have it. There we go, my personal homage to John Burkow. Okay, so see you on Thursday afternoon.